Hello, I'm Anika from Made to Sew, and welcome to my How to Sew Scrubs tutorial. Over the last couple of weeks, I have been inundated with emails asking for help and advice when it comes to sewing scrubs and the details that you might find in a pair of scrubs. I know that a number of you are sewing scrubs for your local health service, so firstly, a huge thank you for everything that you're doing. Now, I've put together this tutorial where I'm going to be showing you how to sew a scrubs top and a pair of scrubs bottoms. I've worked with a women's wear pattern and I'll pop a link to the pattern that I'm working with in the description box below, but the same applies if you're working with a men's pattern. I've tried to cover different techniques that you might find in a variety of different patterns. Now, this is a long tutorial because I've put all of it together in the same tutorial with the idea that it acts as a resource for you. So I, in the description box below, I have gone through and clearly detailed each of the techniques that I teach and the time that you will find that in the video. I do not expect you to go and watch the whole of this tutorial. I just want you to be able to use it to help you with a specific skill that perhaps you're struggling with. I share how to do patch pockets, inseam pockets, how to sew trousers together, a waistband with elastic or a draw cord. Then we move on to the top where we do the sleeves, side seams with slits, and two different options for the neckline. I show you how to draft the neckline that you see here for your pattern if you want to follow my technique for this and how to sew it and then how to do a more simple standard v-neck. The idea being that you can come back to this tutorial as you need. I know that a number of you are sewing scrubs in groups so do feel free to share your group that you're working with in the comment section below. Hopefully you might be able to connect with other people in your area. You're going to want to grab some cotton fabric and I'm working with a thread that is contrasting so that you can hopefully see my stitching, but you're going to want to work with a thread that matches your fabric and the pattern that you choose to work with. Throughout the tutorial, I show you options for how to finish the edges, whether that be using the overlocker or serger, or if you want to use a flat filled seam or French seam, because perhaps you don't have access to an overlocker or serger. If you're going to do a flat fold seam or a French seam, you may wish to change the seam allowance on your pattern. So do think about that before you begin. Now let's go and cut our fabric out. I'm going to presume that you're happy with cutting out your fabric. Now I've gone ahead and pre-washed my fabric and given it a good steam with the iron. I folded it in half with the right sides together and pinned my selvage edges together. Then I have laid on my pattern pieces and I've made sure that the grain line is parallel to either the folded edge or the selvage edge at both the top and the bottom. And obviously you're going to need to look at the details on your pattern to know whether you're cutting to, whether you're cutting it on the fold or whether it's not on the fold. Go ahead and cut out your pattern pieces using either pins and scissors or weights and a rotary cutter if you prefer. Once you've cut out your pattern pieces, you're going to want to record some of the markings. You can either clip into the notches on the pattern. You can use carbon paper and a tracing wheel to record the notches and to record any other details such as the pocket placement. Or you can use thread tracing or tailor's tacks to complete the same technique. Once you've cut out your fabric, you can continue the preparation by cutting out the interfacing pieces that your pattern requires and fuse this or iron this onto those corresponding pieces. Now you've cut out and prepared all your fabric, the next step is to consider the stitch that you're going to use to sew the scrubs together and how you're going to finish those seam allowances. The feedback that I've received is that the edges of the fabric need to be finished with an overlocker or serger and they can't be simply zigzagged. I believe this is due to the garments being washed at high temperatures. If you have access to a serger or overlocker, you can obviously complete one of these techniques. You can either sew, press open your seam allowances, you can serge the edges of your fabric before or after you have sewn the seam, or you can do this technique where I've sewn it and I have serged the seam allowances together. I'm going to be serging or overlocking in this tutorial simply because it's quicker. However, if you don't have access to a serger or overlocker, you could do a flat filled seam. And my sister that sent me some pictures of her scrubs, all of them have a flat filled seam because the scrubs are actually reversible. And you can use the seam either way up. 
There are a number of different ways of doing this. You can do a fake flat filled seam, you can do a flat filled seam using a foot, or you can do it and follow the instructions that I've got in a separate tutorial, which I'm going to link here. This is just one of the methods, but hopefully it will help you if you don't have access to a serger or overlocker. We're going to begin by looking at how to sew the pockets or patch pockets, because I'm presuming that you have a few pockets to sew on both the pants and trousers and on the top of the scrubs that you're making. The first tip that I would like to share is that I want you to make a template of your pocket. So this is the pocket without seam allowances. If you have a pattern piece, you could simply cut off the seam allowances and you can make this in card or in paper. The reason why this is useful is it means it helps us to achieve perfect pockets. So all of your pockets, if you have more than one, will be the exact same size and you'll have nice sharp edges. Place your fabric with the wrong side facing up and take your template. Line it up so that you have the right seam allowances in the right place. For me, I've got one centimeter or three eighths along the sides and the hem and three centimeters along the top edge. You're going to then iron the seam allowances around the templates, keeping the corners nice and neat by just folding it like so. The reason why we complete this step is when you remove the template, you have nice creases showing the edges of the pocket on the sides, top edge and bottom edge. Now we want to finish this top edge of the pocket neatly, creating what I've done here already on this one. The first thing you're going to want to do is you need to press under this very top edge of the pocket again. So in my pattern it's asked for a one centimeter three eighths press and then along my fold line it would be two centimeters or three quarters of an inch. Yours might be different, it might be five mil or it might be a quarter of an inch along this very top edge. You can of course use a ruler to check that you are pressing this correctly. Once you've pressed under the top edge, you're going to turn the pocket around so that you've got the right side facing up. And what we're then going to do is to fold the pocket along the top edge with the right sides facing each other along that top line of the pocket. Now, you can use your templates here again if you want to, matching up the bottom edge of the pocket, and then you would be able to press the top edge over itself like so, leaving that small amount that you've pressed towards the wrong side on the very top edge of the pocket. This will hold everything in place while we go to the sewing machine. At the sewing machine, I want you to sew across this crease at the sides, from the top folded edge of the pocket down to where this piece of fabric ends. So you're only going to be sewing for, in my case, two centimeters, three quarters of an inch. And I'm gonna do that on both sides until you get something that looks like this. Now I've gone ahead and sewn on both of these sides here with a little back stitch at the start and at the end. I'm gonna turn this around now so that you can see. I have also overlocked or surged the three other edges of my pocket. You are welcome to do this, however, I'm only doing this on one of these pockets to show you as a sample that it's an option. My sister's pockets in her scrubs, none of them were overlocked or surged on the inside, so I don't believe you need to. Turn this around to the right side by folding on the edge of that stitching and turning it through. And you can use a point turner or a little sharp tool just to poke out that little corner. Do that on both sides. And then the final step is to pop your template back in and give it a nice good press, especially around that top edge. Because what we're going to do next is go to the machine and stitch along this top edge. So with this one, I haven't obviously overlocked or surged the edges, that's fine. And I want you to sew about two to three millimeters away, all the way along this top edge here. You can join me at the machine and I will show you how I do this. You want to sew an accurate even distance all the way along the top of the pocket. Ideally, you want to be sewing approximately one eighth or two to three millimeters away from this folded edge. I tend to sew this with the wrong side of the pocket facing up so that you can check you're sewing this accurately. You can, of course, use pins to hold this down. Now I'm using an edge stitching foot here, which I think is one of the easiest options. And I'm lining up that middle part of the edge stitching foot 
with the fold of the fabric and I've moved my needle slightly so that I'm stitching the desired distance away. You can also use the edge of your presser foot and the edge of your presser foot when you move the needle, whatever works for your machine. Of course, you could sew this from the top side of the pocket as well and work out the seam allowance that you want to follow. Now I've pulled both of my threads out of the machine bed to make sure that they don't get caught up on the right side. I've positioned my needle in right close to that side edge of the pocket and I'm going to begin with a small forwards and then backwards just to secure it. And then I'm going to sew all the way along making sure that I'm lining everything up. I'm using a standard 2.5 millimeter stitch length, but you can increase your stitch length if you want for this top stitching. When you get to the edge, you're going to want to sew as close to the edge of the pocket as you can. Again, sewing one back stitch to secure it. And there you go, trim your threads for a neat finish. So the pocket's been stitched across the top edge. The final thing we need to do to prepare this to be attached to the garment is to turn it over, wrong side facing up, and perfect these corners. At the moment, they're a little bit bulky, so we're going to mitre them. Open up the seam allowances, and what you want to do here is to fold in the corner at an angle, so that you're almost folding in a triangle shape. You want to match up the crease that you can see in the corner with the crease of the seam allowance here, and the same along the bottom. Once you've done that, you can then refold up the bottom and the side seam allowances and you should get something that looks like this. Press in the angle, matching up the creases like so, and then fold up the bottom of the pocket and the side of the pocket, pressing it in once more and checking that you have a nice shape to the corner of your pocket from the right side. I recommend that you prepare all of your pockets to this stage and now you can attach them all to the areas of the garment. This is batch sewing and will really speed up the process for you. So you should have marked points on your garment where the pocket needs to be placed. You may have marked them with thread, thread tracing, tailor's tacks, you can use chalk, you can even draw the box of the pocket if you want to. A really good tip if you're new to this is to cut the pocket out of the pattern, lay the pattern onto the back of the trousers and then you can simply draw around the pocket placement with chalk or a removable pen. Then you can position your pocket on like so, match everything up and make sure that the other side is symmetrical. You can pin this in place or head straight to the machine without any pens if you have chalk lines guiding you. Here is one that I've already completed. You can join me at the sewing machine in a minute for a step by step of this. The key here is that we're going to be stitching around the sides and the bottom edge of the pocket close to the edge of the pocket. So sort of two millimeters away, a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch depending on what you feel comfortable with. You are going to begin along this horizontal stitching line. So you're going to begin at this corner here. You're going to have to stitch away and this width of the stitching along the top edge is only one centimeter three eighths from the side of the pocket. So you begin on the edge of the pocket where it meets the horizontal line. You stitch out to the top edge one centimeter away from the side of the pocket along the top edge. Then you stitch down the side turning at the corners along the bottom back up one centimeter along the top edge and then a diagonal line back to that horizontal line again. You can do a back stitch. I tend to do one or two stitches maximum forwards and backwards to secure it. Hopefully you understand the stitch that you're going to need to complete around your pocket. Now I recommend that you watch this section first if you are new to sewing pockets on and then perhaps complete it with me. So we're going to begin at this corner here where the horizontal stitching line that we made on the pocket meets the side of the pocket. So I need to turn my work around and I'm going to end up with a bit of work in my machine. But we have to sew all the way around so that's not preventable. 
I'm going to lower my needle so that it is in the position that I want it to be in. And I'm going to put my foot down so that the front of my foot is aiming towards the top edge of the pocket, one centimeter away from the corner. Now, if you remember, we have to sew this diagonal line first. You are welcome to draw it on with chalk if you want. I have marked in chalk the one centimeter from the edge of my pocket, and you can do that with a pin as well if you prefer. I've just tried to make this clear for the tutorial. Now I'm working with my edge stitching foot and I find that when I teach my customers actually prefer using this foot because they get more accurate results around the rest of the pocket. However, I often use a standard foot and you're welcome to use a standard foot, use the edge of your foot, move your needle, have a play with what works for you. Predominantly we want to be sewing close to the edge of the pocket and you will see that in a second. This first section we're just going to be sewing on the pocket itself on that diagonal line. So at the moment, my needle is in line with the front part of my edge stitching foot. I'm going to sew one stitch forwards and backwards to secure it, making sure that my threads are out the way. And then I'm going to sew on the angle following the front part of my foot here. When your needle reaches the top edge of the pocket, you want the stitches around the pocket to be about a sixteenth to an eighth away, so sort of two millimetres away. You can, of course, sew a different distance away. You can sew a wider distance if you prefer. It's up to you and obviously what you're making. Now you want to stop with your needle right in the exact position at the top of the pocket. So sitting a sixteenth to an eighth away from the pocket edge, two millimeters. Then I can raise my foot and turn my work so that I'm going to be stitching across the top of that pocket for one centimeter. You can, of course, use the hand wheel on your machine to sort of fake the last stitch to get it in the right place. I'll show you that in a second. Now, sewing along the top edge of the pocket and for the rest of the pocket, if you're using an edge stitching foot, I could move my needle. So I'm going to move it two positions to the left, meaning that now when I sew, I'm going to be stitching exactly a sixteenth to an eighth away from the pocket edge and I can line up this front of my foot with the edge of the pocket. And this is where the edge stitching foot is really useful. So we sew that centimeter needle in, lift the foot and turn so that we can continue down the side of the pocket. And I'm just lining up the pocket edge with the front part of my foot here. Obviously, if you're using a different foot, that's totally fine. You can use the edge of your foot. You can move the needle position, really work with whatever helps you to get an accurate finish. I'm going to sew down the side with the aim to stop at that bottom corner and pivot and turn. So if you think you're coming and you might be one stitch too far, this is where you can use your hand wheel on the machine because I can simply turn that forwards to do one stitch. And if that stitch is too big, I can cheat slightly by lifting my presser foot and putting the needle down where I want it to go and then turn the corner. You also might have a one stitch button on your machine. So we're gonna sew along the bottom. If you sew a stitch too far, you can simply turn the hand wheel backwards to bring that stitch back out. Pivot and turn at the next corner, making sure that the needle's right in the right place. And sew up the final side of the pocket. You can use pins, you can use the chalk lines like I shared with you to make sure that your pocket is in the right place. Now we're going to sew up to the top edge. Make sure that the needle is finishing right in position. I might have to make my stitch slightly shorter. Turn and sew across for one centimetre. I've got a little chalk there to show me and then I can lift and turn and now I'm going to want to put my foot back down with the front of my foot pointing towards where the horizontal line that you previously stitched on your pocket is. And I'm going to want to lift my needle because I need to put my needle back into the center now, just for ease. And you don't have to do this. You can, of course, keep your needle in the position, even if you're using the edge stitching foot. It's just sometimes easier for it to be in line with the front part of the foot because then I know I'm sewing in the right place. When you get to the end, you can back stitch one stitch and then pull your work out. Just like so. Next, we're going to move on to the inseam pockets, which you may or may not have in your scrubs trouser pattern. 
Now this is the inseam pocket from the right side. So I've sewn the pocket and I've also sewn the side seam attaching the front and the back trouser legs together. Let me show you this from the wrong side as well. I have used an overlocker or serger to finish both the side seam and also the pocket. I'm going to share this method of sewing the pocket with a rectangle rather than just having the pocket opening out of the side seam. This is because it will allow you to sew the pocket and the side seam without the use of an overlocker or serger. So you would be able to sew the pocket using a French seam and I have a tutorial that shows you how to do that if you're interested. And with this method, we could then flat fill seam the side seam of the trousers. Take your front trouser piece and position it with the right side facing up. Take your pocket bag for the front. It might be that all your pocket bags are the same, that's fine. And you're going to place it right side down. So the right sides are together. Using your common sense when it comes to the shape of the pocket bag, you're going to put your hand into it. Use your markings on the side seam and match up where the pocket should be positioned. And you're going to match up the two edges of the pocket and of your side seam. Now you might have a pocket that looks like mine if you're using the same pattern as me with this sort of rectangle cut out. Or you might have a pocket pattern that has a straight edge. Either is fine. If you're using a pocket pattern that has a straight edge, then your pocket is going to come out of the side seam. All this will mean is that it would prevent you from doing a flat fold seam. You can still overlock or serge. If you have the same pattern as me, your pocket is going to create this opening or you're welcome to do this to your pattern if you like the look of it or if you want to have the ability to do a flat fold seam. Hopefully you can see the chalk line that I've drawn on here. This is going to be my stitching line. So I'm actually going to be following the pocket shape, that rectangle. So I'll be sewing from the side seam one centimeter which is my seam allowance, three eighths, turning the corner and then one centimeter from the pocket edge, turning the corner again to come back to the side seam. You can do that with your pocket if you would like. You're going to want to start and end on the same markings that your pocket has given you. And you would just be that rather than sewing your seam allowance from the edge, you would come in a little bit further. For example, I've come in two centimeters from the edge or side seam of the fabric. The first one centimeter would be the seam allowance. The second one centimeter or three eighths is this extra rectangle to give the opening like you've got here. I have gone ahead and I sewed my pocket on using the rectangle method. You may have chosen a different method. Now, if you're doing the rectangle method like I've done here, the next step is we're going to need to cut directly into the corner as close to the stitching as you can but not through the stitching. You need to be brave here because if you don't cut close enough, you won't get a nice corner when we turn this around in a second. And you're going to do this on both sides. You're cutting through both layers of fabric. Once you've cut into both corners, you're then going to turn your pocket bag around and we're going to give it a press. And what we need to do here is to work it so that we're creating that rectangle gap that's going to be the gap of the pocket. So you just need to cautiously turn the pocket on the inside. If your corners are looking puckered, it's probably because you have not cut close enough. Press the seam allowances open first, and then you should be able to get a really nice crisp finish around the pocket edge making sure that you can just see the seam allowance from the pocket side, meaning you won't be able to see anything from the front of the garment. Now the pocket is pressed, we're going to head to the sewing machine and we are going to top stitch around this opening. The distance that you choose to top stitch is up to you, but remember that you do need to leave enough seam allowance to be able to sew the second pocket bag on, which is a centimetre. So I'm top stitching very close, about a sixteenth to an eighth away, so sort of two millimetres, and that's in line with the patch pockets and everything else. I would recommend when you top stitch a garment that you try to be consistent with your distances. One thing you do want to think about if you don't have access to an overlocker are the seam allowances here. If you have access to an overlocker or serger, you can simply overlock or serge them together, just like I've done on this example. If, however, you're making these without an overlocker or serger, 
what I would recommend is that you press both of the seam allowances over towards the pocket so that they meet the stitching. If your seam allowances are both the same length, you may want to stagger them like I've got here. And we're gonna press that over and then press the pocket back on itself. It does add a little bit of bulk to that pocket edge, but what it will mean is that when you do your stitching around in a second, your top stitching, it holds those seam allowances in place and will prevent them from fraying. If you have a pocket with a straight edge, you would be welcome to understitch that pocket at this time now because you're not going to be able to top stitch it like we're going to do with this rectangle opening. In that case, all you do with your pocket is you push the seam allowances towards the pocket and understitching is when we're going to be stitching on the pocket, catching the seam allowances and sewing close to the seam that joins the pocket to the trousers. And you would just do that between the pocket opening. All that does is it helps to keep the pocket staying inside the garment. So it's a nice little added extra. If you're unsure about understitching, I will be covering it later on when we get to the necklines section. To top stitch the rectangle opening, I'm using my edge stitching foot with the needle in the same position as I use for sewing on the patch pockets so that I'm nice and consistent. You're going to stitch and then turn around the corner with the needle in, lift the foot and sew down the length of the pocket opening and turn around the bottom corner as well. If you are doing edge stitching because you have a pocket that is in the seam rather than this rectangle opening, you can also use your edge stitching foot to help you get a nice accurate finish there. The next step is to sew the pocket bags together. You want to place the right sides of both pocket bags together, lining up all of the edges. You're welcome to pin this or you can head straight to the sewing machine and you are going to sew all the way around from the edge all the way around the curve back to the other edge, just attaching the pocket bags together, not sewing through the front of the trousers. Use your seam allowance that you're working with. Mine is one centimeter, three eighths. I have sewed around the outside of the two pockets to join them together. And I have also surged or overlocked around the edge of mine. If you don't have access to an overlocker or serger, you could do a French seam here instead. The next step is to join the side seam together. So the side seam of the front and the back. And so right sides together, and then you are going to sew along the side seam here. I would recommend sewing from the hem up, that's my usual practice. And I've got a one centimeter three eight seam allowance. This is where if you don't have access to an overlocker or serger, you could do a flat fold seam here. In that case, you would position the wrong sides of the fabric together and you would need to follow a flat fold seam tutorial. Simple straightforward seam here. You are just going to follow the seam allowance in your pattern and you can whiz all the way down the side seam of the legs, back stitching at the start and at the end. Be cautious that you don't catch in the pocket bag or any aspect of the pocket opening that you shouldn't be catching in when you sew over the section. It can be a good idea to pin the pocket bag to the front of the trousers out of the way. Now let's head to the overlocker to finish this edge. I'm using my overlocker with three threads and simply the right needle, making this width of the stitch as narrow as it can be. And that's generally what I do when I'm finishing the edges of fabric. Now for this project, I am overlocking or surging the seam allowances together. You are welcome to do them together or you're welcome to do them separately. If you're overlocking or surging your seam allowances together, you can do it relatively closely to your stitching line on the sewing machine. I tend to use the machine foot as a guide. At the very front of your foot, on most overlockers or serges, there will be two sort of grooves or raised parts. Now these are in line with the needle position, so you should have one on the left and one on the right. I am only using the right needle when I'm doing my three thread overlock to finish the edges of the fabric. So I'm going to line up the stitching with the left groove, and then that means I'm overlocking relatively closely. If you have overlocked or surged the seam allowances together, press them towards the back and then it's optional. But if you like, you're welcome to top stitch along that seam that you've pressed towards the back. I used my edge stitching foot and I completed it the same distance that I used for my patch pocket for consistency. 
but you're welcome to do any distance that you like. You can increase or change your stitch length and you can also use a double needle or twin needle if you wanted to, to create a fake flat felt seam look. I have also surged or overlocked across the bottom hem of the trousers. You don't need to do that because when we turn that up later, you can turn it under a second time, but it's optional. If you want to overlock that, you're welcome to do so. Next, we're going to be sewing the front rise and the back rise to join the two legs together. Feel free to pin your pocket bags down flat so that they can't get in the way. Now, front rise is just going to be the right sides of the fabric together and sewing around this curve. The same will happen with the back rise, sewing around this curve here. Both of the crotches, the front and the back, have been sewn and then overlocked or surged, pressing them towards the left when you are looking at the wrong side. So I've pressed the front one towards the left and the back one towards the left when the garment is inside out. The next step is to sew the inseam. So you're going to be sewing the legs on the inseam, the rise or crotch now has the seam allowances going in opposite directions so that you don't have bulk there. You're going to match the seam and you can sew from the hem on one leg all the way along the inseam, over the join between the front and back rise and all the way down the other leg to the hem. You can sew this and then overlock this or serge this. I've gone ahead and sewn the inseam and overlocked all of the way from the hem of the trousers on both sides all the way around the crotch and back down to the other side. Press the seam allowance towards the back. Next step is to hem the trousers. So you can either simply overlock the hem and then press it up by the desired amount on your pattern. Or like I've done, you can press it under once and then twice and then there really isn't any need for you to overlock this. My pattern has a three centimeter hem, so I've pressed under one centimeter and then two centimeters. In inches, that would be three eighths and then three quarters. And I have simply run that through the sewing machine, sewing close to the top edge. The final thing you need to finish with the pants is the waistband. Now, my pattern actually asked me to get a piece of elastic that measured 2.5 centimeters, one inch in width, cut it to the desired size of the pattern, stitch one centimeter across the end, press open, and then actually attach this elastic to the top of the waistband. So I would have unrolled this, put the elastic on the inside, and overlocked them together. So I would have had to have distributed the elastic, so divided it into at least four, front, back, and sides, uh, to make sure that the elastic was evenly distributed as I was overlocking it on. Then I would have pressed it down and I would have stitched close to the bottom edge and the top edge of the elastic. Now that is one option that you can of course complete. However, my preference is to create a channel and in that channel you can either put the elastic or you can put some cotton tape or something that you make as a tie cord. Talking to my sister and her scrubs, none of the scrubs she owns have elastic in them. They all have tie cords so that you can adjust the waist easily. So what I have done instead is I've pressed under to the wrong side, approximately five mil or a quarter of an inch. And then I've pressed over approximately three centimeters, one inch and a quarter. And I've done that all the way around the waistband. Now, if you wanted to introduce elastic into this waistband, you could go straight to the sewing machine and you're going to sew along the bottom edge, leaving an opening of approximately four inches, 10 centimeters, to be able to insert your elastic. I'd probably do it at the back. And you can also top stitch around the top edge. I will be stitching around the top edge and the bottom edge in a second, but I've decided to introduce some cotton tape. Therefore, I need to have a means for the cotton tape to be able to come out of the waistbands, to be able to pull and adjust the trousers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create a buttonhole. And the buttonhole is gonna be sitting on the front here, and this is where the cotton tape is going to come out of. You could also 
put buttonholes on the very top edge of the waistband if you wanted to. That is actually where the buttonholes on my sister's scrubs trousers are because they're reversible. Or if you didn't want to do a buttonhole, you could put an eyelet or something. You just need a means to be able to pull the tie cord out of the waistband. Once you've pressed your waistband, you're going to need to draw on your buttonhole. And I worked out that I wanted my buttonholes to start 2.5 centimeters from my center line. You could probably do it a little bit more than this if you wanted to. This was simply based on a pajama pattern that I used to teach. So 2.5 centimeters either side of that central seam and I would draw the vertical lines for my buttonholes. Now this cotton tape that I've got here is two centimeters wide, three quarters of an inch. So you could make a buttonhole the same size for this to fit through. You want it to have a snug fit. Therefore, I'm going to measure five mil from the top edge of the waistband and five mil from the bottom edge because my current waistband is three centimeters. In inches, this is three quarters of an inch. So you'd be making a hole that's three quarters of an inch wide. You can, of course, get slightly wider tape, perhaps 2.5 centimeters, one inch would also work. Now you're going to need to, before you go and sew your buttonholes, you're only sewing them through one layer. So you're gonna be opening this out like this. And you're going to need to apply some interfacing onto the back. You don't want this interfacing to be visible. So just a neat little rectangle that goes directly behind the buttonholes to stabilize them. Sew the buttonholes following the method that works for you. I'm not going to go into detail about sewing buttonholes here simply because I have a whole series on sewing them and it depends on the machine that you're working for. The same applies for marking them and cutting them out. I'll pop a link to the playlist here. Once the buttonholes are sewn and cut, you can then sew your waistband channel. I recommend sewing the bottom of the waistband first. I'm using the edge stitching foot to do that stitching a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch away, about two millimeters. If you decide that you wish to include elastic in the waistband, then I recommend leaving a gap at either the side or the back of approximately four inches, 10 centimeters. You will sew this up at the very end once you've inserted your elastic. If you're attaching cotton ties, then you don't need to do that because we're going to insert them into the buttonholes at the front. Once you've sewn around the bottom of the waistband channel, you can, if you want to, complete the same stitch around the top of the waistband channel. If you're introducing elastic, you can sew all the way around the top of the waistband channel. You just need to leave a gap at the bottom to insert the elastic. So now the waistband channel has been sewn, you can take the cord that you want. You can use cotton tape or you can use something that you've made to go through here. It's totally up to you. And with a safety pin, you are going to feed this through the opening, trying not to twist it as you go all the way around the trousers. If you're working with elastic, the same principle would apply. I said leave an opening in the side or the back, use a safety pin to take it all the way around, making sure that you do not lose the other end. So I've brought the tie all the way around and out of the other buttonhole, making sure that it wasn't twisted. If you had a piece of elastic that you were using in the waistband, I would recommend that you overlap it flat, like so. And personally, I tend to sew a little box with sort of an X in the center of the box, just to really secure it. Once you've done that with your elastic, you would be able to sew up the gap along the bottom edge of your waistband channel. You would obviously have to pull the elastic to stretch it whilst you do that. The other little tip I have with elastic, if you've chosen to use elastic in the waistband channel, is to, once you've sewn the waistband channel back up, give the waistband a pull like this and make sure the elastic is evenly distributed around the waistband. Then, I would recommend stitching through at the center back, and you can also do it at the side seams, through the, sort of stitch in the ditch of the seam allowance, through the elastic. What this does is it helps to prevent the elastic from twisting. So I tend to do that if I've applied elastic into my waistband. Final thing for this is to finish the ends of your tie, whatever you've used. For this, I'm simply going to trim them, fold it once, quarter of an inch, five mil, fold it again, quarter of an inch, five mil, and then I'm gonna run that through the sewing machine. Sewing close to the inside folded edge. 
sew over the end of the ties using your preferred method. You may struggle if the ties are quite thick, in which case I recommend that you start in the middle, sew out to one side, start in the middle and sew out to the other side. And there you have your finished scrub pants or trousers. Moving on to your top, the first thing you're going to want to do is to attach the pockets in the position of your choosing or whatever pattern you're following. You may have them at the waist or you may have them at the breast area. Complete the pockets in the same way that you completed the patch pockets for the trousers or pants. If your back pattern pieces weren't cut on the fold, you can sew them together and you can either press them open, overlock or serge them, or press them to one side. Now we're going to look at sewing the neckline of the pattern. I'm going to be sharing with you how to do two different necklines. The first method, this is my favorite method, and this looks similar to the neckline that my sister has on her scrubs. I will show you how to draft a pattern you can use and how to sew this neckline. Then for the second method, I will show you how to sew a standard v-neck. I also have a very detailed tutorial that I will link to here if you want more information about sewing a v-neck. And this is the neckline that the pattern I'm using comes with. Working with your front pattern, you want to firstly mark the stitching line on that pattern. So I've been measuring in from my v-neck edge, one centimeter or three eighths, because that's the seam allowance with the pattern that I'm working with. If you are working with a pattern that doesn't have a v-neck, you're obviously going to need to draw that v-neck shape first. Now I'm laying on a piece of pattern paper and I'm going to draw along one side, it doesn't matter which, of the v-neck, drawing along the stitching line. You might find that the v-neck is a straight line, you might find that it has a slight curve, in which case you need to use a French curve. You will want to work with a nice sharp pencil, I'm using a sharpie so that it's easy and clear for you to see. You're also going to want to continue that straight line up the other side for about five centimeters, two inches. And you want to record the shoulder stitching line as well. So far, you've drawn the stitching line for the shoulder, one side of the V-neck and the other side of the V-neck by about five centimeters, two inches. The next step is to decide on the width of this placket that we want to attach to the neck. So I'm going to be working with three centimeters, which is an inch and a quarter but about 2.5 centimeters, one inch. You could probably do a little bit more as well if you wanted to. And I'm going to now measure from this stitching line three centimeters or an inch and a quarter. And I'm going to draw that on, just like so. And you can see that we wanted the other side of the V-neck to connect to this new line that we're drawing. So we're obviously drawing everything here without seam allowances. You're also going to want to extend the shoulder across here, like so. Think about the width that you choose to draft your neck binding in, and make sure that you have enough space to come closer to the neck along the shoulder line, and that this point isn't going to be too close to the neck. And then we can add some seam allowances. So you're going to want to add, if you've got a one centimeter or three eighths seam allowance on your pattern, you want to add the same amount. We need to add that to the shoulder seam, we want to add that to this edge because this is the edge that's going to sew to the top. And we also want to add that to this edge on the other side of the V-neck. And then we can extend these lines to make sure that everything joins up. And this line here. Okay, now what we're going to do is we've got everything that we need from the pattern underneath. So we can remove that pattern out of the way for a second. And now what we want to do is we want to fold this along this line here. So we can call this the fold line if you like. And we're going to fold the paper along that line. Perfect. And then we can cut this out. You can use scissors, you can use a rotary cutter, whatever works for you. And we're cutting through the two layers of paper because we want this to be a folded piece of fabric on the garment. Remember when you're cutting lines, you're always cutting away the line because that is extra after your measurement. 
Now you want to open this back up and we're going to give it a grain line. So we want this to be cut on the bias grain. So the bias grain is going to be that 45 degree angle, which is going to give this a little bit of stretch. Now to do a bias grain, you can draw a little square and then you can hit through the corners, diagonal corners of that square to give you a bias line. The other good thing about using a ruler like mine is that I can actually get a bias just by lining up the diagonal corners of the squares, centimeters, on my ruler. So that is my grain line. You may want to write that this edge is your shoulder edge and the other edge is your neckline. And you are going to need to cut two of these on the bias and interface them. And we can label this your neck placket, neck binding, whatever you want to call it. You can also remove this extra pointed corner that you've created by drawing the seam allowances. Simply measure your seam allowance, one centimeter or three eighths from that corner point, draw a line across and cut off the extra paper. Once you've drafted your neck binding piece for the front, you are going to want to check that the front neck and the back neck will still sew together. You may need to make some amendments there. So I recommend folding over your neck binding and pinning it onto the front as if it were sewn. You're pinning the stitching lines together. It can be a good idea to draw your stitching line across the shoulder. Remember along this front edge of the binding, this is a fold of your fabric, so there is no seam allowance here. You can also draw your stitching lines onto the back neck and this will then allow you to double check how much extra, if any, do you need to add to your back neckline. Now, if I line these seam allowances on top of one another, I need to be able to have one seam allowance to sew around the neck of the back because this edge of my neck binding is a folded edge of fabric. It doesn't have a seam allowance. So I'm still going to need to have that one centimeter or whatever seam allowance you're working with around the top of the back neck. So you should be able to line everything up and you want to have approximately a centimeter, three eighths or whatever your seam allowance is for the back neck to sew it. And you can see that I've added that extra piece of paper here. Obviously do check with your pattern that you can actually extend the shoulder in this area and raise the neckline slightly. Make sure you have enough room to do so. Finally, you would need to also draft a new back facing piece that was a copy of your back neck, excluding your seam allowance down the center back if you have one. I've gone ahead and cut out two fabric pattern pieces using the pattern piece that we drafted for the neck binding. I have also cut out two interfacing pieces and interfaced or fused each of these fabric pieces. Finally, I've pressed them in half along the fold line that we drew with the right side on the outside. With the wrong side of the fabric facing up, I recommend that you iron a small piece of interfacing. This can be a little rectangle, it can be a little circle, and the interfacing needs to be positioned right where the bottom of that V is. And this will just support that area because we're going to be cutting really close to the V. It will help to prolong the life of the garment as well. This is how we're going to be taking our work to the sewing machine in a second. I've got the right side of my top facing up here. Let me explain what I've done with attaching these plackets. Now, the first thing that you might want to do, so I've got left placket, right placket, garment facing up. And the plackets can go on either way because they're folded in half. Now, the first thing you'll probably want to do is to draw on your stitching line for both your V-neck and the bottom of your V-neck for the plackets. This is optional, but if you are a beginner, I believe that it will just help you, especially when you're sewing your first one. So if my seam allowance is one centimeter or three eighths, I can just draw that on using a removable pen or chalk, just like so. And you would do the same for the bottom edge of these plackets here. You can of course draw your stitching line on all the way along if you wanted to, just like so. And you can just about see the one I've already drawn onto this side. Now, we are going to be sewing this v-neck on and we want this right hand placket to be on the top. So this one's going to go underneath. It's going to look something like this when it's sewn. And the other thing we want to do is we want to be catching in this edge, this seam allowance here, into that seam 
on the left side of the packet so that it looks really nice and neat. We are going to take a pen and pop a pin in the bottom of that V for the right placket. And now, and this is just something that will just help you understand, I'm hoping, how it's going to work. Take that pin and put it in the bottom of the V of your main fabric. And then swivel your placket all the way around until you have got the raw edge of the placket matching up with the raw edge of the left side of your neckline. And then you can pin that in place. The left plackets can go down. We're matching up the raw edges of the placket with the raw edge of the neckline. And we would want to remove this pin and put it through all three now. So you should have your V-neck points for the left plackets, the right plackets, and also your neckline underneath. You may want to draw on your stitching line at the shoulder of both the plackets and the garments and match those up. But if they don't match perfectly, don't worry. The plackets are cut on the bias. They can stretch ever so slightly with handling. And we want to make sure that the V-neck is correct. That's the most important thing. So I'm going to pen the rest of my edges all matching up nicely. First step at the sewing machine, we're going to begin at the shoulder and we're going to stitch down to the V stopping at the very point of that V. So if I were to draw that on with a pen, it's going to be stopping here. Begin at the shoulder with a couple of stitches forwards and a couple of stitches backwards. And then you can sew along the edge of the neckline, keeping everything nice and flat following the seam allowance that you're working with. As you near the point of the V-neck, make sure that all of the pieces are sitting flat as they should be. And sew into the point that you marked. Back stitch at the point. The next step is to cut into the main body fabric right into where that stitching is. Now you can do this at the machine. I've just pulled it off the machine to show you the process. So I'm going to cut right into the stitching, not through the plackets. And you want to cut really close to the stitching, but not through it. You need to cut really close to the stitching, otherwise if you looked at it from the front side, there would be a pucker. Then you should be able to match up the right hand side of the placket with the edge of the neckline. And you should find if you've cut close enough that you're also including the left side here as well. So you want to match everything up really nicely, just like you did before. From the wrong, wrong side, you want it to look like this. You're going to pick up this part and head to the machine to sew from the dot that should be the point of your V-neck all the way up following your seam allowance. And you're going to want to catch the garment when you sew this. From the right side, it's going to look something like this. If you have a pucker here, so I recommend pin it and pin it like I've done where I do what's called pin basting. So I'm pinning where I'm sewing. And then you can look at it from the right side and you can say, yes, that looks right. If you have a pucker at the V point, you are going to need to cut a little bit closer. Begin by placing the needle at the dot that you created for the point of the V. Lift the foot up and then you can just double check underneath that you are catching the garment fabric. You're going to want to do, again, stitch forwards and backwards to secure this. And then you can sew up following either the drawn line if you've drawn one or your seam allowance. Once you've finished sewing your second side, you're going to want to give it a press. I recommend pressing it from the wrong side first and then from the right side making sure that you do give the garment a little bit of a tug so that you don't have any creases or sort of pleating where the garment attaches to the binding. Next, we're going to finish the inside. So if I turn this over, it's going to look like this at the moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna whiz down here and here with the overlocker or serger to give it a really nice finish. Just a little option if you don't have access to an overlocker or serger. I would recommend that you trim down these seam allowances that are closer to the garment front and then you should be able to tuck under this top seam allowance and press it. 
And in a second, we're actually going to top stitch this from the right side. So you should be able to catch this in your top stitching. But the easiest way is to simply run it through the overlocker or serger like I've done here. I've whizzed down both sides using the overlocker. And then I've got a little bit of thread at the bottom that I need to tidy away. So I've threaded it through a large eyed needle and we'll just thread that back up on the underside. Next, we're going to head back to the sewing machine and we are going to stitch a nice top stitch around the neckline. Up to you how far away from the seam that joins the garment to the binding you stitch. I tend to keep all my stitching consistent on a garment, so I'll probably do the same technique that I did with my pockets, about a three millimeter distance, one eighth of an inch. Working with the edge stitching foot, but you can use any foot that you have for your machine. You're welcome to move the needle, use the edge of the foot, just do something that you can be nice and consistent with this top stitching or edge stitching. Now I'm lining up the center part of my foot with the seam that joined the placket to the garment and I am move my needle to the left twice so that I'm stitching about an eighth away from the seam. And you're just going to work your way all the way along. When you get to the bottom of the V, lift the foot, leave the needle in and turn your work. Continue up the other side, back stitch at the start and at the end. And you should be left with something like this. Give your garment another good press and then we're going to work to attach the shoulders and the back facing. You want to place the back garment right side facing up and position your front garment right side facing down. So the right sides are together, matching up the shoulders. Now you should find that you have extra of your back neckline here and you need that because the back neckline has one centimeter and this edge is on the fold. So you want to start matching up from the end of your shoulder seam. You do not need to have overlocked the shoulders yet. I went ahead and overlocked my front shoulders but you don't need to because we'll overlock them all together in a second. You're also going to want to take your back facing. This should have been interfaced and should match your back neckline. I have gone ahead and overlocked or surged the bottom curved edge of this and I would recommend doing that at this stage. If you don't have access to an overlocker or serger, you can simply press under five mil, quarter of an inch, and make sure that when you pin this to match the shoulders, that you're keeping it pressed under along this edge. So you need to match everything up, all of the wrong edges along the shoulders on both sides and also the back neck. If your neck bindings extend past the edge of the front shoulder, you can trim them off so they are in line. Next, head to the sewing machine. We're going to be sewing across the shoulders from the very edge where the sleeves are going to be inserted, across and then around the neck and then across the other shoulder. One thing you may want to mark is this little point here. Depending on how accurate your sewing is, having a little mark can be useful because you want to make sure that you don't catch the neck binding when you turn the corner. This is a simple seam to sew, just continue using your seam allowance. Make sure if you haven't overlocked the edge of your facing that you, when you stitch over it, it has been turned under. Sew along following your seam allowance, follow the marking that you have placed, or just make sure you're accurate with your seam allowances. Needle goes in, foot's raised, and turn the corner. You don't want to catch the neck band in the corner so that you have a nice finish when it's turned around. Exactly the same on the other side, trying to keep them both symmetrical. So this is what the stitching should have looked like. Now, before you get to trimming and overlocking or serging, I recommend that you just pull this through and check that the join between the back and your neck binding is nice and neat. You don't want to have loads of back neck sticking out here and you also don't want to have caught in your neck binding. This comes back to making sure that the back pattern piece fits the front and that you're accurate with your sewing here with your one centimeter seam allowance or whatever the seam allowance is that you're working with. Next, you can chop off this corner nice and close to the stitching to remove any bulk. And you're also going to want to cut into the neckline so that the curve sits nice and flat when we turn this around. 
I've gone ahead and overlocked or surged all the seam allowances together, and I will do that on both shoulders, which is why you didn't need to overlock or surge them up to this point. I've also gone ahead and trimmed away any extra bulk from the back seam allowances there. I've just cut them nice and close, two to three millimeters away from the stitching line. Okay, next step is to turn this through. And you've got a couple of options here. You can either edge stitch or top stitch along the shoulder, around the neck, and along the other shoulder. Or you can top stitch just the shoulders, and we can under stitch the neckline instead. I think I'm going to use that method. So I'll join me at the sewing machine and I'm going to be showing you how to understitch the back neckline and then we'll do the two top stitching portions. Understitching is when you're going to be stitching on the facing so that the stitching isn't visible from the right side of the garment, but you're going to be catching your seam allowances. So the seam allowances need to be pushed towards the facing. I'm using my edge stitching foot and I've moved the needle two steps to the right so that I can run the previous seam right into the middle of my edge stitching foot. However, you're welcome to use any foot that you have. The edge of the foot is often a good method of lining things up and you can move your needle. You're going to begin as close as you can to where the shoulder and the neck join. And this can be a little bit tricky to get it all in place, but once you're there, you can start, stitch forwards and backwards to begin, and then we're just going to stitch across the back neckline constantly checking that those seam allowances are going towards the facing. And I'm just going to sew as far as I can. So again, when you get to this corner of the neckline, it becomes a little bit tricky. So just sew as far as you can and try and be consistent where you start and stop on both sides. If you would rather do the edge stitching or top stitching method, you're welcome to do that instead. Back stitch at the end. And that's your understitch seam there. Give everything a nice press before continuing. You want to press your facing from the wrong side, making sure that you can see a tiny amount of the right side from the wrong side. You also want to press your shoulders, making sure that the seam allowances are going towards the back and that you don't have any pleating where your facing joins the shoulder or from the shoulder front. So you may need to give your fabric a bit of a pull here. Then we're going to edge stitch the shoulders just for a little bit of detail and to hold everything back. I'm using my edge stitching foot again and I've moved my needle so that I'm stitching an eighth of an inch, two to three millimeters away from the shoulder seam. You can sew using your desired distance. You'll do this on both sides and you're just going to sew the width of the shoulder. However, if you didn't understitch your back neck, you could now continue around the back neck and across the other shoulder. And here is the finished neckline. So the back neck I understitched and then I edge stitched or top stitched the shoulders. As I said, you're welcome to, instead of understitching, take that all the way around the back neck and across the other shoulder. Final option is that you could go and stitch around the bottom edge of your back facing here. Again, you could use that edge stitching foot and stitch relatively close to the edge, sort of two to three millimeters, an eighth of an inch unless you've been stitching further away in all of the other places. I recommend being consistent. Next, I'm going to be showing you how to do a standard V-neck option, which is easier than this method. If you prefer that option, then continue watching. Otherwise, if you've done this and you're ready to move on, please skip forward to the sleeve insertion. All of the details in terms of timings for this tutorial are in the description box below. To complete a standard V-neck neckline with a facing, you're going to need to firstly sew your garment together at the shoulders, and I recommend that you overlock or serge them, either prior to doing this or afterwards, pressing the seam allowances open. I've done the same for my center back seam, but obviously if you've cut your center back on the fold, that's absolutely fine as well. Another little detail is whenever you're doing a V-neck, it can be useful to iron a little piece of interfacing onto the wrong side of your front, exactly where the point of that V-neck is going to sit. This is because we're going to be cutting really close into the V. Now you should have a front V-neck facing and a back V-neck facing. These need to be interfaced and they need to have the shoulders sewn I've also overlocked the shoulders, pressing the seam allowances towards the back, and I have overlocked all the way around the outside edge of my facing. 
complete all of the process to this part, and then we can attach the facing onto our garment. Position the garment with the right side facing up, take your facing and position that with the right side facing down so that the right sides are together. Start by matching up all of the edges. Match up the v-neck shape, match up the shoulder seams, making sure that, sure that the seams are sitting exactly on top of one another and pin everything in place. You will probably find it useful to draw on your stitching line at the very bottom of the V. If you're confident and don't need to do this, do not worry, but if you are a beginner, I would recommend it. So I'm measuring my one centimeter, three eighths from the edge of my fabric and continuing it on past the V. And we have to continue it so that it joins up with the other side, like so. You only need to do it for an inch to two inch, so 2.5 to five centimeters either side of the V shape. When we get to the sewing machine, we're going to start sewing one side of the V, about five centimeters, two inches away. You're going to stitch down to the V, needle in, turn, sew all the rest of the way around the neckline, back to the V, needle in, turn, and five centimeters up to the other side. By bypassing this area, it means that we're really securing the V and just gives a little bit of extra longevity to a garment. Trim away any excess seam allowance at the center back and from the shoulders, just so that when you sew across these, you're not adding extra bulk into the seam. Start approximately five centimeters, two inches away from the V. And you can use the drawn on lines to help you if you want to. Sew to the V points, Put the needle in exactly on the point, lift the foot up and turn your work. Foot down and continue to sew, following your seam allowance, around the rest of your facing. Make sure that the edges of the facing and the garment are lined up at all times. When you get to the shoulders, make sure that the seam allowances are going in the right direction, open for the garment and towards the back for the facing. And try and hold them in position so that they stay matched. When you get back to the start, you're going to sew over yourself, needle in at the bottom of the V, foot up, turn, stitch directly over the same stitching for approximately five centimeters, two inches, the other side of the V, back stitch and pull out your work. Taking a pair of scissors, cut right into the center of the V, as close to the stitching as possible. Then press open the seam allowances between the facing and the garment body. And you want to press right up into that V. Complete the same all around the neckline and clip into the curves if required. Once the seam allowances have been pressed open all the way around the neck, you're going to push the facing to the inside, and I recommend working from the inside of the garment. Working your way around, ironing the edge of the facing. You want to see a very small amount of the right side of the garment coming through, about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch. For the bottom of the V, you're going to need to give a small tug and you can work your way around pressing everything in position. If you find that the point of your V is still puckering, then you probably haven't cut close enough. Now, usually when I'm sewing a V-neck, I would go ahead and understitch the neckline. This means that I would push the seam allowances towards the neckline and I would stitch close to the stitching line. I actually do that prior to pressing and I find that I get really good results doing that. If you're interested in copying that technique, I have a tutorial that shows you how to do this. I'll pop a link to it here. However, the majority, or should I say all of the scrubs that I've looked at, haven't actually had any understitching taking place, probably because it's a little bit time consuming and scrubs are something that is generally sewn up quite quickly. Instead, they're just stitched around the outside edge of the facing to hold everything in place, and this stitching is visible on the right side of the garment too. Check that you're happy with your v-neck from the right side before you go ahead and do this, and then you may wish to pop some pins in 
to hold the facing in position. And we're going to be literally following the edge of the facing all the way around. You can, of course, sew closer if you want to. This is really up to you. But generally speaking, most of the scrubs that I've looked at are sewn right around the edge of the facing. And you're welcome to curve this bottom edge or sew it in the angles that it currently is in. For this example, I'm using my edge stitching foot and I've moved my needle over so that I'm just catching the edge of my facing. For ease with this tutorial, I'm just going to be sewing the exact copy of my facing onto the right side of the garment. At those corners, needle in, lift the presser foot and work your way around. Complete the same process around the back facing. And there you go, that is your final v-neck. And I think this is a really easy way to get a nice technique and is less complicated than the first method that I shared with you. If you have done this v-neck, you would then continue and follow the rest of the instructions, putting in the sleeves and sewing the side seams. Now your garment may not have sleeves that you need to attach simply because the sleeves may be drafted in the pattern of the bodice, in which case skip forward to the side seam section. We're going to position these sleeves in using the flat method, which means that we're going to be positioning the sleeve into the armhole before sewing the side seam. The first thing you're going to want to do is to find the right sleeve for the right armhole. So you should have notches on your sleeve. I have one notch here, which means the front of the armhole. Two notches if you have them would mean the back of the armhole. And one notch means the center, which needs us to match with the shoulder seam. So this is the correct sleeve because my one notch here matches to my front armhole. Now I can start pinning the sleeve to the bodice. I've got my garment here with the right side facing up. This is the correct sleeve to fit into the armhole. So I'm going to turn it over with the right side of my sleeve facing the right side of my garment. And I'm going to match the top notch with the shoulder seam here. Taking my pins, I'm going to pin this. Once you've pinned the top shoulder notch, you can then work your way down and you can pin the side seam to the underarm seam of the garment. When I'm pinning, I'm thinking about how I'm going to feed my fabric through the machine. So the fabric is going to be on my left as I'm sewing. And then I'm going to do another pin with the front side seam and underarm seam. Then you can match any other notches. So if you've got a single notch for your front on the sleeve that matches the garment armhole, you can match those together. And the same for the back. Generally speaking, if you have any ease in your sleeve, which means that the sleeve is larger than your garment armhole, that is going to happen after the notches that are present on the sleeve and the armhole. Approximately three inches, 7.5 centimeters up from your side seam. So this first part can be matched like for like, and then if you have any ease, it needs to happen between the notch or three inches, 7.5 centimeters up from the armhole, and the notch at the top of your sleeve that matches your shoulder seam. And here you can just pick middle to middle and middle to middle to distribute the ease. When I say middle to middle, I mean, I sort of eyeball the middle of the sleeve and the middle of the armhole and I put those together and then work in between those areas. Put in as many pins as you feel you need, but again, you don't have to pin here. You can simply go to the machine and make sure that you match everything up sewing along. If you are a beginner, I would recommend that you pin. Same for the back. Hopefully you can see the sleeve is now attached into the armhole and we're going to sew from one side seam all the way up and over the sleeve cap down to the other side seam, following the seam allowance in your individual pattern. In my case, that's 3 eighths, one centimeter. Work your way around the sleeve with a back stitch at the start and at the end. Try and match up both of the edges all the way along. And there may be times where you need to give the armhole a little bit of a pull so that it lines up with the sleeve. Constantly check underneath that you're not accidentally catching anything. You want both layers to be nice and flat. 
and concentrate on one area at a time. Don't think you're gonna be able to move all the way around the sleeve in one smooth motion. You're going to need to prepare an area, sew an area, prepare an area, sew an area. The sleeves have both been inserted and once they were sewn, I overlocked them or serged them just like so, using the same technique that I showed previously with the trousers, surging relatively close to the original stitching line. I then press them and we're ready to move on to the side seams. Now, if you don't have access to an overlocker or serger and you want to add sleeves to your garment, you can use a flat felt or French seam to sew those in. Feel free to add top stitching or edge stitching to any of the seams that you sew. It's totally up to you. The next step to finishing our garment is to sew the side seams, which is also going to incorporate the underarm seam of the sleeve and the vent on the side. Once sewn, you are going to end up with a side seam and underarm seam that looks like this with the pressed vent or slit ready to stitch at the end. The final finish here would be the hem of the sleeve and the hem of the garment. The first thing I'd like you to do is if you want to overlock or serge your hems, you can complete the front, the back, and the sleeve hem, cutting nothing away, just finishing the edges. However, you have the option to press these under, so if you don't have access to an overlocker or serger, or you don't want to do this part, please feel free to skip it. Next, if you are using an overlocker or serger, you are going to run down the side seam. So you'll begin on the underarm of the sleeve, sew over the join between the sleeve and the body, and sew around the curve in one process. Then the edge of the vent can be completed in a separate process. I would recommend that you send the seam allowances between the sleeve and the garment in opposite directions. So this one has gone towards the body, the other one will go towards the sleeve. This means when we sew them together, there is less bulk in that area. Let me give you some tips for overlocking around curves. My main piece of advice when you're sewing around a curve on the overlocker or serger is to try and feed the fabric in as if it's straight. So if you're sewing a concave curve, you're gonna be pulling more of the fabric round and it might be buckling up on this side, but whatever you're feeding in is straight, the stitching ends up straight on the edge. The opposite way, if you're sewing a convex curve, you're going to be feeding and pulling the fabric around so that you're feeding it into the machine. Once you've overlocked or finished the edges, match up the underarm seam with the seam allowances going in opposite directions. Pin the rest of the seam together, starting from the sleeve hem and working all the way down the side seam of the body. If you don't have access to an overlocker or serger, you can complete a French seam with a vent or slit at the bottom of it. It's a little bit trickier. The other option is that you simply sew your seam allowances like we're doing here and then press them open, tuck the edges of the seam allowances under and edge stitch close to that so that you have a little feature on the right side of your garment. The vent or slit on your pattern at the sides might be slightly different to mine. You just need to work out where the pattern requires you to stop sewing the side seam. In my pattern, it is in line with the end of this curve here. So approximately about here. I know because I have a little notch on my hem that I am going to be folding back all of this section like so. Therefore, I'm actually going to need to come away from my one centimeter. I'm not following this curve around. I have one centimeter seam allowance or three eighths up here and I'm gonna be sewing straight down to this point where I will be stopped sewing. Do check your individual pattern. My pattern might be more shapely at the side seams because it is a female designed scrub top. Just make sure that both sides are symmetrical. Sew on the sewing machine following your seam allowance. Stop sewing where the slit will begin, making sure that you backstitch to secure this area. Use a seam roll to successfully press open these seam allowances. You'll just pop that inside all the way along, pressing the seam allowances open. For the slit at the bottom, I have a notch along the bottom edge that shows me where I needed to press this back, and I stopped sewing in the right place. So I was able to give this a nice press 
in position. Now we have the final things to do, hem the sleeves and hem the hem of the top, sewing around the slit openings as well. The hem on the garment that I'm working with asks you to fold one centimeter or three eighths, press it, and then two centimeters or three quarters of an inch and press it. And you'll need to do that for the front and the back of the garment. This is why you don't necessarily need to overlock or serge the edge here. However, if you have overlocked or surged, you could simply press it up by the total amount, three centimeters, an inch and one quarter, so that you don't have the added bulk of folding it over. The sleeves on my garment are a fold of two centimeters, three quarters of an inch, and I've pressed it, and then again of two centimeters, three quarters of an inch, and I just use my little sleeve roll or seam roll to work my way around that sleeve opening. Again, you do not need to have overlocked or surged the seam allowance here. Let's look at how we can finish the corner between the hem and the slit neatly. I'm going to share with you a couple of different options for mitering this corner. This is my preferred method and the first method that I'm going to share with you. To begin, you're going to need to press the hem up by the amount that your pattern requires and press the facing for the slit in. You could press the hem up with a double fold or you could press it up with a single fold. It doesn't matter whichever works best for you. Using a pair of scissors, you're going to want to cut right into the corner of where the hem and the slit meet. You want to cut through all of the layers of the fabric except for the front layer. So you're cutting through the hem and the slit. Then you can open up the layers and you should find that there is a clip on the hem edge and also on the edge of the slit. Fold the fabric so that it's right sides together, matching the two clips together. So the clip on the hem with the clip on the edge of the slit facing. Position in a pin. Now you are going to sew from where the two clips are to the corner that you should be able to see here between the two creases. The crease of the hem being pressed up and of the facing for the slit. You're welcome to draw this on with chalk if you prefer, so that you have a line to follow at the sewing machine. At the sewing machine, you want to sew all the way across this drawn line. From the very corner and the folded edge of the fabric, you want to sew on and off this edge, all the way across to the clip points. Hopefully you can see that I've been to the sewing machine and sewed this. The next step is that we want to cut away some of this extra fabric to remove the bulk. However, I recommend that you turn it around to the right side first, just to check that you're happy with the finished results. Take a pair of scissors and cut away the bulk. You want to cut very close to the corner edge or the folded edge of the fabric. Press open the seam allowances. You can use a point press if you like to help you. And use a point turner to turn it around to the right side and poke out the corner. Now this is my preferred method of a mitered corner. It looks really neat and it removes all of the bulk. Give it a final press in position. Another option is to, of course, simply press up the hem and then press over the facing for the slit. And you can use that as a quick alternative. Finally, you can use the same method that we use for mitering the corners of the pocket. Again, you're going to need to press up the hem and the facing for the slit as you desire. Unfold the hem and the facing. Then fold the work back in on an angle. You're folding almost a triangle shape here so that you can match up the creases for the hem and the creases for the slit on top of one another. Then you would proceed to fold up the hem and the facing, just like so. The same technique we used for the pockets. And you can complete this with a double fold to the hem as well if you prefer. Personally, I didn't like this method as much on the pattern that I'm working with, simply because the facing for the slit is quite large. So it doesn't match up with the seam allowance for the hem. Mitre the corners as you desire, and then we can head to the sewing machine to sew the hem. I'm going to be sewing close to the top inside edge, approximately an eighth of an inch away, two to three millimeters. For the hem of the sleeves, you can go all the way around, and I'd recommend using the edge stitching foot, which looks like this, and that's what I used on the trousers. For the garment, you can either use the edge stitching foot or you can use the standard foot and move the needle and use some of the edges, the inside or outside edges of your standard foot. For the sleeves, it's easy. You're just going to go all the way around. For the hem, you're going to need to start at the edge. So going across the edge of the slit. So you need to work out 
where you're going to put your foot down and move your needle to for the bit that you fold it up and where that's positioned on the metal plate so that you can start at the very edge and continue across. Feel free to increase the stitch length when you're doing your hemming if you would like. Complete the same technique for the front and the back of the garment hem. Once you have sewn all the way across the hem, the final thing you need to do is to sew your slit and add a little bit of reinforcement. Now you're going to want to sew across where the opening is here. You can obviously eyeball this and just do it on the machine, or if you want a little bit of extra guidance, you could draw this on with chalk or a removable pen. I simply took a right angle from the seam allowance and drew a line across at the opening to my slit. In terms of the lines down the side, you're gonna be sewing from the hem up across and down the other side. So you could either use the edge of the slit here and sew perhaps a centimeter, three eighths away, or I preferred to keep my stitching line parallel to my side seam. So I actually measured three centimeters from my side seam and drew a line, that's an inch and a quarter. Really it's up to you and the pattern that you're working with, what you choose to stitch here. So from the bottom of the hem and back stitch, again, you're welcome to increase your stitch length if you desire. So up in line with the opening, finish with the needle in, lift the presser foot in line with the opening, press the foot down and sew across the opening to secure this area and sew all the way down to the hem, sewing off and back stitching. When it's finished, it's going to look something like this. You can, of course, also add a bar tack across this opening just to reinforce that area and help to prevent the side seams from breaking. And there you have it, your finished scrub top. Give your garment a final press and it's good to go to a new home. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed the video and that you feel more confident with sewing the aspects of the scrubs pattern that perhaps you were struggling with to start with. I wish you all the best with your sewing and thank you for everything that you're doing.